We ready? It's on. Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to have you here this evening. My name is David Morgan. Most of you know who I am. Uh, I want to welcome those that are here with us here in the sanctuary at the Hayden Lake Seventh Avenue Church. We're so glad that you could be here this, this evening. Also, I'd like to welcome those that are watching online. Uh, wherever you may be, whether you're here in the United States, the state of Idaho, or around the world, the Philippines, and I know that we've had quite a few friends from the Philippines tuning in and from many other parts of the world, so we're very grateful to have uh, a fellowship that's worldwide. Amen? And uh, so just grateful that you could be here. Our uh, program for this evening continues through the, the week. This week is Spiritualism, Healing, and the Last Great Deception. And so, uh, and our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Edwin Noyes, and he's a medical doctor. He is the director of, I, uh, excuse me, a graduate of Loma Linda University in California, a well-known university. I was a U.S. Army medical officer in the War of Vietnam. Practiced medicine privately in the United States for a number of years and has served as a surgeon in a mission hospital in Thailand. Well, well-rounded experience. And so, um, since retirement, Dr. Noyes has been active in medical evangelism and health education, both in the United States and abroad. He's the author of many books um, and articles exposing spiritualism in health and healing practices, and is the founder director of the Health and Spiritual Research Network. So, uh, without further delay, let's um, bow our heads for prayer. Let's start with prayer and invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want to invite even those who are online watching, uh, you can bow your head or kneel as you prefer, and let's pray and ask for God's presence to be with us, and that we'll be blessed by the thoughts that are expressed. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the amazing grace that you have poured into our lives. It is with gratitude, Lord, that we assemble together, whether online or here in this building. Because, Lord, we want to learn more of you. We want to be ready when Jesus comes to take us to our home. And for this purpose, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be here with us, with each person listening. We pray that you'll give us attentive ears, a willing heart, and a mind that discerns truth from error so that we can be faithful to you in these last days. And so we thank you, Father, for this love and grace that you have poured into our lives. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, Dr. Edwin Noyes, please come forward. We'd love for you to come and speak. The time is yours. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for the invitation to join with you and to share with you this evening. Amen. I'm not unfamiliar with this part of Idaho and Washington as I've been to a number of churches over the past several years to share with them also. You may wonder what caused my interest in this subject, that of the spiritualistic deceptions. In 1971, President Nixon went to China, opened up China, which had been closed for 20-some years. When he came back, we heard more about some of the traditional Chinese medicine practices than we did about the political opening of China. And patients came to the doctor's offices around the country asking about these uh, different practices. Acupuncture, acupuncture was the primary one that one of the reporters had had a, an operation while he was in China and he re saw some other surgeries where they evidently were using acupuncture for an anesthesia. And so patients coming to doctor's office were just asking all sorts of questions, especially of the anesthesiologist before they had surgery and he would offer them the opportunity for that, and they tended to decline. But we, did, as physicians, did not know what to tell the individuals and to answer sensibly the questions they had. Just did not know. I knew nothing. I'd never heard the word before, even through medical school. 
And um, when they asked this question, I had a concept of what it was, but I didn't have authority, and so I began a study. Fifty years ago, I started a study to understand the basis of this type of thing. And so what I will be sharing over this next several days is my understanding that I have learned, learned from those that have been in it and have come out from the books and so forth. When I took medicine, the first year we as students were anxious to stomp out disease. But the instructor says, no, you've got to learn what the normal is first. So tonight, I want to review the story of our health message to have a foundation for what God has given us, the blessings that have come with it in the knowledge of health and healing. When we have a good understanding of that and see the benefits, then we are going to be much more likely to recognize that which is a counterfeit. Amen. So let us journey tonight. We uh, want this to be certainly a spiritual journey. But the story of our health message is uh, taken from a little book by D.E. Robinson. I had the privilege as a freshman in medical school to have a class conducted by Mr. Robinson. He had been the personal secretary of Ellen White for 15 years before her death. And so he brought to us a history of the progression of the medical work within the church. Dr. Uh, Mr. Robinson was a very good instructor. He wrote a little book called The Story of the Health Message, which you can get in the ABC. Sorry. I don't, don't think I wiggled my ears. <laughs> but it, it doesn't want to stay. I'm sorry. We'll go ahead. Is that coming through? Fine, yes. All right. In this book, we learn some very important things that I want to share with you tonight. We're just going to skim over some areas. Let's go back to Egypt at the time of the Exodus. The knowledge that the Egyptians had of health and healing was extremely primitive. It was spiritual. It wasn't a cause and effect understanding. And so the Hebrews that were going to be going in the Exodus had the same knowledge. Now, as God took the Israelites across the desert, he gave them principles that are still the standards of public health today. But all of that from the papyrus writings of the Egyptians has not stood the test of time. It was all mystical. Had nothing practical in it at all. They had no understanding of the cause of disease. Where God gave to the Israelites, he didn't explain all of the reasons. He says, here's what you do, and it will bring health and healing. And remember at the time they came, they were so thirsty, they came to some pools of water, but those pools of water were bitter, and they murmured. And Moses was told to take a bush and throw it into the water, which then following that, here is the comment, that you'll find in Exodus 15, verse 26, and said, If you diligently heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you, which have brought on, I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Here's a promise. God is giving instructions you follow them, you have health. Deuteronomy 8.4 Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. And David said there in the Psalms, and there was, was none feeble among their tribes. So God gave blessings when he brings spiritual health, spiritual opening and light. He also shares in physical light. You can go clear back to the early days in uh, Mesopotamia. The, the records they have show that they had some sense as to what was the cause of disease and some reasonable approach to their health and hygiene. They'd lost it by the time of the Egyptian, uh, the Exodus, 
And it wasn't just Egypt, it was Greece and all the other countries of history show that they had no better knowledge. But God in this darkness of spiritual time brought light in spiritual as well as in health and healing. Then in the early church, there were physicians that did writings and those have been found and read. And they showed some intellect, showed some understanding of the cause of disease. But with the time when about the fourth century the church divided the soul from the physical body, things begin to go downward in the knowledge of health and healing. As darkness, spiritual darkness came across the land, so did the knowledge of health and healing. This is an important point because we're going to see it again later on. During the dark ages, it was a dark in many ways. All knowledge of health and healing pretty much vanished. The doctors that were present in those days fled to Arabia, they fled on to India and into the Mesopotamian area at Baghdad. They left Western Europe because they were outlawed. The church the church outlawed surgery outlawed medicine, the pain of death. And so for a thousand years, the Dark Ages was very dark physically. What was the approach to disease? Uh, exorcism. This is where exorcism came in. It was spiritual. It was spirit-caused. Not any knowledge of health and healing relevant to our lifestyle. And so as we progress along, there became the Renaissance and begin some spiritual light begin to come into Western Europe. At the same, same time, very, very slowly, a little knowledge of health and healing began to slowly come forth. And it wasn't really up till the middle of the 1800s that we begin to see a significant advance in the knowledge of health and healing. They really had no knowledge of chemistry very rudimentary, physics, physiology, no knowledge, and there was no method of scientific investigations. But about the middle of the 1800s, it began to slowly come forward. And toward the end of the 1800s, it was progressing and has continued to progress since then, searching for truth in physiology, in the function, the physical laws that God has given us that govern our body the medical science and the sciences of the universities were looking for truth. Not always have they understood it, but that was their goal. And so in the middle of the 19th century, the 1800s, began this slow advance. But let's take a glance at the, meth the lifestyle of the people of the time. If you were ill, you were not given water. You were not given fluids. You put in a dark, hot environment. Uh, you might be given um, mercury, arsenic, antimony, nicotine, strychnine. These were what were called drugs at that time, these uh, particular minerals. They did not know anything about bacteria. It wasn't until I believe the 1860s, that bacteria were discovered and recognized, so the cause of infectious disease was not understood. Cleanliness of home and surroundings, unheard of. Just live the way you want to. That gives you a little illustration of lifestyle. Nutrition, no knowledge. How did they preserve food? Well, they salted down the pork, they salted down uh, that different uh, pickles and so forth, there wasn't good preservation. We didn't have the, the transportation to have the great stores with abundance of good food like we do today. Totally different. And in the winter time, things got uh, pretty bad and they waited for spring to begin to feel better. High salt, cooking things in a way that prom promoted uh, carcinogens, lots of tobacco and alcohol, just think of it. Oh, and working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Think of these conditions. 
And then we have those long hours. Oh, another one. The, it was a status symbol if you could have white bread because it had the, the grain when it went through the, the old mist gr uh, grinding to bring the coarse cereal, the coarse grain. Then they would put it through silk sieves and what finally got to the bottom was just that white fine stuff and did they love that bread? But all the nutrients and minerals, most of them were removed by that time. And so it was a status symbol. And eventually in about the 1870s when they were able to process the grain cheaply through uh, iron rollers, now everybody could have the white flour and that became something everybody wanted minus those minerals, vitamins, and so forth. So we have this pattern of poor health at that period of time. Medical treatment wasn't so good, usually worthless, because the medical concept of cause of disease was not what was the cause of disease. They believed it was an imbalance of four different types of fluids in the body. They knew nothing about bacteria or all these other things. And so all of their approaches was to deal with balancing those fluids. And uh, sometimes it was deadly. So with this type of condition, it was ripe for alternative approaches. Who wouldn't want a different way? And some of those approaches weren't too bad. Some were ridiculous. But if they didn't do what was being done, they got better. And whatever they did got the credit for it. So you could come up with a ridiculous type of approach and you just didn't do the medicine things that was being done, those hard drugs, those minerals, and you got people did better, and so they would credit whatever idea they had. And some of those ideas were all right. Now, there was a ship sailing at sea, and typhus was a common uh, infection that occurred on these ships. And when the sh sailors got sick, they would put them in the hole of the ship, where it was dark and damp, hot, and there they would die. There was sick, this one ship, 1877, was so, so heavy with its sickness that those that looked like they were going to die kept begging for water. The ship doctor said no, but finally they says, take us up on deck and just souse us. He says, they're going to die anyway, go ahead. They were the ones that got well. So he passed the knowledge along, but it was soon lost because that was against the medical knowledge of the day. You didn't do that. And that was lost for a hundred years. Then there was a gentleman by the name of Vincent Pritznes. He was in Austria, just as a lad. He sprained his wrist, put cold water on it, felt better. And the Lord must have led him. He had an injury later where he was run over by a carriage, broken ribs. He used water again, felt better. And in time, he became known world round for his water treatments. And there were American doctors that went to Austria and to learn from him and came back and established uh, water treatment centers here in the United States in New York. In the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White and, and, and uh, her husband went to one of those. And those were good places and good treatment. So you saw some of the alternative therapies had some value. Today, we still, I as a practitioner, commonly, day by day, would advise people using hydrotherapy in ways they could do at home. And uh, I was known in my town for, by some of the other physicians for that particular uh, interest in sharing. Now, back in the 1830s, there was a gentleman, a minister by the name of Sylvester Graham. Have you ever heard of Graham crackers? Graham bread? We don't hear the Graham bread much anymore. The crackers are still around. But I think the Lord, personally, I believe the Lord gave him because he had the health message just like we've been given. And Oberlin College had a, was vegetarian. This was in the 1830s and 40s. Billy Graham came from that college, Oberlin College. But they lost their way, and I believe then God gave it to another group of people. That's my, I have no thing to back that up. That's my suspicion knowing what happened in the things, there was no way he could have known and understood what he was teaching. There was no research, nothing. 
It had to be given to him from God. That's my judgment. So God was looking out after his people. There was a group of people that uh, had been disappointed because Christ didn't come. And about the same time, 1844, there, in the 1850s, there had been pr promotion of teaching in the schools, the, the schools around the country to teach a little hygiene. But when the God did not arrive, Jesus didn't come on that second coming as expected, we had that small group of people begin to study. Why, what had they missed? They knew the Bible was true. Somehow their interpretation wasn't quite right. And after four years of doing this, this young lady was given a, knowledge, a, a message from God to the group of people that were studying. No coffee, no tea, no tobacco. Why, of all things, was those particular things chosen early on? Actually, it's six more years before the next message. Coffee, tea, tobacco. They affect the way we think. And they were studying having hope asking for God to enlighten their minds and so I'm sure God gave to them so that their minds were more clear and he could work with them now tobacco was one of those things says no but it took 15 years before the church was free of tobacco use God was patient wasn't he and what was interesting at the same time, there were some of the members that reading the Bible learned that the consuming the pig, the animal, the swine, was prohibited in the Bible. So they began to agitate it. The Lord sent a message, leave it alone. I'll bring that message in in its due time. It's not ready yet. It would have just caused a breakage up of the group that was studying. God is, understands and is very gentle and how he brings things to us. So then the second vision, the second message, 1854, six years later. And what's interesting, the particulars here that God shared with the people. Still not the pig. Interesting. But what was it? Cleanliness. Home and surroundings. If you were to go back and understand how people lived then, and remember, some of you are old enough to remember when we had the horse tub, we'd put it in the kitchen and pour the hot water in it. The first one that got there got the clean water. The last one there had what was left. Anybody ever experienced that? Oh, in the back there's a hand or two. I did. <laughs> I lived as a boy where we didn't have electricity and you, it was always the hand pump and, and these things. So, But we were clean. But back in those days, especially in the winter, it might go months before they'd have a bath. And they didn't have this shower you can climb into every day or every week, whatever you do. Cleanliness of body and surroundings and clothing. Important. Important for infectious disease. We know that. But they didn't. What was the second thing? Avoid grease. What's grease? Well, it was lard, a pig lard as well as beef lard. Anything that made actual grease this way was to be left alone. Avoid it. Still a good Good message, isn't it? We hear that today. All right, what next? Well, let's not use that refined grain. Let's use the coarse grain. I believe this was referring to where they would put it through the sieves, you know, crushed it in the old grist mill, and it was sort of coarse, and they would put it through the silk sieves. She says, no, let's use the coarse, not that white stuff. It's not... Not, it is not a poison, but it's not good as the other. That's the thing. So here we have these messages from God. She said, I saw that God was purifying unto himself a peculiar people in whom he can delight. He will have a clean and holy people. I saw that God would not acknowledge an untidy, unclean person as a Christian. Rather important, these simple things. Our souls, bodies, and spirits are to be presented blameless by Jesus to his Father. And unless we are clean in person and pure, we cannot be presented blameless to the Father. Now the General Conference, the first one was in 1863. 3,500 members, 21 delegates came together 
to form an organization so it would be organized and could move forward to spread the gospel. And two weeks later, in a worship service in this house, this lady had the third health message. This was a grand, long, prolonged, hour-long message. And in this message, something that tied in the health and the lifestyle in with our eternal destiny. Pointing out that these things, not just to be healthful, but in the long run, as the mind was cleared, we would choose and would understand what was done for us on the cross. Amen. With those poisons in the system that we talked about, one cannot perceive that fine, delicate understanding. And so the purpose of all of this was to have a clear mind. Interesting, in the last few years in the medical science, a lot of research on the mind. That's the big emphasis now. And I have a book come from Tufts University on nutrition in the brain. And it's pretty much Seventh-day Adventist health message on that part. It's interesting. And they point out the, the value of lifestyle relevant to Alzheimer's and dementia and so forth. Exercise of the brain, exercise of the body, plant food diet, that which is the best to keep a good brain. We had that message long ago. So here we have that lifestyle that we're told would affect our eternal destiny. How often we hear people making jokes about the health message. I don't want to be guilty of that. I was again shown that our health reform is one branch of the great work which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. It is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the body. So this is a part of present day message. He, God, designs that the great subject of health reform shall be agitated, the public mind deeply stirred to investigate. For it is impossible for men and women with all their sinful, health-destroying, brain-enerving habits to discern sacred truth, through which they are to be sanctified, refined, made fit for the society of heavenly angels in the kingdom of glory. In the latter years of my practice, I was known for being interested in lifestyle and nutrition. Uh, and people would come, and I would begin to, at the latter years, explain to them the real purpose of the health message that I was proclaiming. It was for a better functioning brain. I, previous years, I didn't have the scientific backing. But when I got that, I shared. And I never found anybody that didn't say that they liked. They understood. That was a great uh, thing to understand. That it was for the brain not just to live long and be an ornery old coot, but to be a Christ-driven individual. Going back, this message of 1863 contained information and directions to start a health institution and other activities. So in 1866 it got started. And they also at the same time began to send out to the believers and others, they got up to 50,000 cir circulation of a health journal. And there was only 3,500 members back there in 1863, but three years later, circulation of 50,000 plus. They bought this building. You see the first Western Health Reform Institute. There's the first building, the first sanitarium. What was the, what was the therapy they got? Well, we'll come to that a little bit here. But that gives you a little clue uh, as to what it looked like. The way in which Christ worked was to preach the word, to relieve suffering by miraculous works of healing. But I am instructed that we cannot now work in this way, for Satan will exercise his power by working miracles. God's servants today could not work by means of miracles. Why? Because spurious works of healing, false works of healing, claiming to be divine, will be wrought. The devil will counterfeit. 
For this reason, the Lord has marked out a way in which the people are to carry forward a work of physical healing. Combined with the teaching of the word, sanitariums are to be established. Very interesting. There was once in here in the Northwest, many sanitariums, only one left, Portland, Oregon. Angels will attend patients. Angels will attend the helpers and physicians to assist in the work of restoration so that in the end, the glory will be given to God and not to the physicians and the helpers. Sanitariums. So this health institute was a great educational system. Physicians were to have, that worked there were to have the highest training in the land, to be no novices in God's work. That hasn't always been followed. There was progress. The Health Journal, the Institute started in 1866. What was the therapy? Exercise, the water treatments, hydrotherapy, vegetarian diet, whole grains, the whole foods, nuts, no alcohol, coffee, tea, or tobacco. Very simple. Fabulous changes came about. Remember, God would help if you follow the way. So we look here just briefly. 1866, the sanitarium started. We look 12 years later, they started the first public health school in the United States. Three months training, young people would come in, they go back to their churches, and they were given, if they went to a medical school afterwards, they were given three months credit for medical training from those three months of public health taught at the sanitarium. Very interesting. Then a school of nursing, because they couldn't get enough nurses of the persuasion in the church, and they had to start teaching their own. Then in 1895, a medical school was opened, American Medical College. Previous to this, many students had gone to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and then in the summer they would work at the sanitarium and they would try to bring these students and keep them in God's way, but too many were going the other, out. And so they established the medical school at that time with Dr. Kellogg as the leading uh, man for this institution and for the college. So 1901, uh, after a number of graduates, 90, 1895 this started, by the time they got a few graduates, they went out across the United States and almost every place that these graduates went, they started raising their own sanitariums. Down through the southeast of the United States, many of them. Northwest here, early on, we had a, a large number. And they, as I mentioned, the only one left is Portland. So nursing schools, all were valuable. The leading man, Dr. Kellogg, you've all heard of him, Dr. John Kellogg, was a brilliant man, and he was helped by the Whites to go to Bellevue uh, Hospital in New York City for three years. And so he had the highest training in the land. He came back, became chief physician of the sanitarium. And now she writes a letter to him. My dear brother, as I have before written to you, I know the Lord has placed you in a very responsible position, standing as you do as the greatest physician in the world, a man to whom the Lord has given understanding and knowledge that you may do justice and reveal the true missionary spirit in the institution which to, is to represent truth in contrast to error. As you look to God in your critical operations, Angels of God were standing by your side, and their hands were seen as your hands, performing the work with an accuracy that made the beholders surprised. Who has been by your side as you have performed these critical operations? Who has kept you calm and self-possessed in the crisis, giving you quick and sharp discernment, clear eyesight, steady nerves, skillful precision? The Lord Jesus has sent his angel to your side to tell you what to do. A hand has been laid upon your hand. Jesus, and not you, has guided the movements of your instrument. He had a, a record of 160 surgeries and only one death. At that time, it was between 20 and 30 percent deaths for surgeries in the other hospitals. Gives you a little idea. There is a picture of the old hospital, Battle, Battle Creek Sanitarium. He was known for starting the cereal, Kellogg cereal industry. His brother actually became the director of that, but his, his research initiated the start. Also, 
He worked with soybeans. But Dr. Miller, who went, known as the China doctor, went to China early, uh, in the early 1900s, really is the one that promoted it more, come out with the soy milk, that is, put soy products on the product. With all of this success, the, the rich and the famous of the world were coming to the institution, and the, those of the United States, the politicians, it was, Battle Creek was known as something. But then there began the cloud of darkness begin to come. Remember we mentioned when God gave light, he gave light and health and healing. And when darkness comes in, it's amazing how the health and healing begins to turn dark as well. And so a particular concept began to be promoted by Dr. Kellogg for a number of years. And uh, it began to cause great problems. About half of the leadership of the church followed suit. And, and the General Conference met 1899, wondering what to do with this. And as they were meeting, we hear the following I'll read. 1889, 1899, General Conference session, Ellen White in Australia, was given in vision warnings which were sent to the General Conference meetings in the United States about the deceptive teachings of Dr. Kellogg. These were pantheistic concepts of the nature and personality of Christ. The theory that God was in all substance, in the air, in the water, food, and so on. Righteousness came by faith that God was in such as we partook of it. That was the teaching. And uh, here is the comment that he made that put in the General Conference Bulletin 1897. This will give you a little idea of his concept, what he was teaching, which almost brought the church down. We have here the evidence of a universal presence. Look at this word, presence. An intelligent presence. Pre-essence presence. An all-wise presence. An all-powerful presence. A presence by the aid of which every atom of the universe is kept in touch with every other atom. This is the teaching. This force that holds everything together, that is everywhere present, that thrills throughout the whole world, the universe, that acts instantaneously through boundless space, can be nothing else than God himself. He's saying God is in you. You have God within you. What a wonderful thought that this same God is in us and in everything. This, he believed of a living God but he also believed that God left a spark of his divinity in all his creation. This is called panentheism. Pantheism is that the force is God itself, and there is no living being as a God, and that's called pantheism. Panentheism describes, they didn't have that word back there, and this is White called, he said that he had a, it was akin to pantheism, his concepts. All right, what did she say about this concept? Already there are coming in among our people spiritualistic teachings that will undermine the faith of those who give heed to them. The theory that God is an essence, a pre presence, he said, but she word, used the word essence. There's a hundred synonyms, synonyms for that expression. The theory that God is an essence pervading all nature is one of Satan's most subtle devices. It represents God and is a dishonor, dishonor to his greatness and majesty. Why do I bring this to you tonight? Because it is the core issue of the rest of the week in our presentations. Amen. Those things we're going to expose, this is the core issue. That which Kellogg brought in has returned. Deceptive beyond words. It has come in theologically and it has come through health and healing. What happened? The hospital burned. 1902, immediately plans, as it was burning, he began to, Dr. Kellogg began to make plans for a new uh, building. The Lord says, build small, many of them. He wanted a big one, so he built a thousand bed. He had the architect that did some of the government buildings, and so it was all loaded with white marble and beautiful structure inside, like the uh, uh, library at uh, Washington, D.C., the National Library, same architect, I think it was, that did this. So he really went elaborate out on there. 
And so to pay for it, he wrote a book and was called The Living Temple. Going to sell this and the proceeds would come. But he filled it with this doctrine of penentheism. What did Mrs. White say about it? And this is, I borrowed this from Eric, this slide. The Living Temple, a book that was written under the inspiration of the arch deceiver. The sentiments, sentiments advocated in the Living Temple made this book a dangerous production, for in the book is taught an insinuating, deceptive science of satanic origin. It is visiting us again today in a little different style. This book's theme was akin to pantheistic concepts called panentheism. Pantheistic. The church publishing house did not publish the book. He had it published elsewhere. The enemy of our souls is earnestly at work to introduce among the Lord's people pleasing speculation and incorrect views regarding the personality of God. The sentiments, sentiments regarding the personality of God as found in the book, The Living Temple, are opposed to the truths revealed in the Word of God. So this was back there in the early 1890s was a great problem. It was the beginning to almost split the church. Many of the leading men went with him. In the book, Select the Messages, page 222, we read not we need not the mysticism that is in this book, the living temple. Those who entertain these sophistries will soon find themselves in a position where the enemy can talk, talk to them and lead them away from God. It's knocking on our doors again today. In the book, the living temple, there is presented the alpha of deadly heresies, the omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to give heed to the warning God has given. Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be a most startling nature. The hospital was built in the 1,000 beds, and it proceeded. But by 1903... Uh, things were beginning to divide, and by 1906, there was a division. Dr. Kellogg continued to teach. He wouldn't, in spite of all of the advice and the letters for years that he was given by the Lord's servant, he would not recant from it. So the final separation of the church and the medical institution occurred in 1906. It was not in the church's name. The entire situation was lost. And the last medical students graduated in 1910. While this was happening, over in California, uh, the Lord had directed that the conference begin some medical institutions. So a conference of 1,100 people in 1904 bought Paradise Valley. Here we are. The one at the top is the Paradise Valley Hospital, and the one below was Glendale. These were... Um, health institutions or sort of resorts that went broke and they got them for a song. Now a little lady is telling, get a third one. We, those aren't the ones, there's to be another one. That's to be a great medical institution, an in educational institution. They say, hey, we got all we can handle here now on debt. What's going on? So in this vision, she saw that it would be something special. And here we see a building here up on the hill I had, for two years, <clears throat> all my meals in this house. This institution is up on this Loma Linda Means Hill Pretty, Pretty Hill, and it had been a, one of those uh, resorts that went broke. Got it for $40,000. It, uh, the gentleman, the pastor that put the $1,000 down borrowed the money on his own name, and there's a story here of great interest how it was paid for. I will not take time to go into that, but... There's how it looks from the other side. It's not there any longer. It's been torn down. It was fire, became a fire hazard. God is in control. So 1905, and this institution nursing school started. 1909, the College of Medical Evangelists. That's what my diploma says. 
<coughs> the <coughs> diploma from the College of Medical Exam Evangelist. It, the training was to be the highest order, students to have the privilege of maintaining a living connection with the wisest of all physicians from whom there is communicated knowledge of a superior order. Now, here's the nurses that first uh, started the nursing school and they got an infant there that's been born and then you have uh, a celebration in 1906, it was born purchased in 1905, but in 1906, there we have Ms. White giving a, an address on the campus. The next picture shows hydrotherapy, the students learning hydrotherapy. Then they're off to do missionary work on the Sabbath. They're in their classroom looking at the microscope. Then to the world, as the graduates became out of there, they began to go to the world. Hundreds of hospitals and clinics around the world. We developed a dental school in 1953. The School of Public, school back here, School of Public Health in 67. And then the name was changed to Loma Linda University. Nowadays, I, it's six or seven medical schools in the denomination around the world, and besides the dental schools. And what have been the influence to the world. What has come about? We have the breakfast cereals. At once they were pretty good. Now they're not so good because they're loaded with just sugar and white flour. But the peanut butter also came out. It wasn't originated in the church, but it was promoted and became popular due to that. Meat substitutes, soy milk for infants, and so forth. You're well acquainted with all of these. And uh, some years ago, Adventist Hospital Administration was invited to China to teach the Chinese how to administer hospitals. There was the stop smoking uh, programs that Dr. McFarland and Elma Falkenberg initiated. Vegetarian was shown to be scientifically sound and superior by Dr. Mervyn Harding. He did this at, as he studied and got his doctoral degree in nutrition at Harvard University. Dr. Register was also, you well remember that name. This hospital was built down at Disneyland and given to the church to operate. This one was built in China and given to the church to operate. In, my, in Oregon, where I live so long, several hospitals were given to the Portland Adventist Hospital to operate. And there we have Loma Linda. I'm wanting to show you the success story of when we followed God's directions, what he gave us. Why would we take and look and partake of health practices that have no history of benefit for thousands of years in a civilization, but it's sweeping through the church like a tsunami. Celebration of the church, of the uh, heart transplants. This was birthday for these students. Dr. Harding, believe it or not, his study back in 1948 was the thing that initiated the knowledge of cholesterol relevant to heart disease. He looked at animal fats and vegetable fats, and his study showed that vegetarians were just as healthy as the rest, but the world paid no attention. They saw that information on fats because the nation was in a, a, a pandemic of sudden death from heart disease, and they didn't know why. And he, they knew it was cholesterol in there, but how it got there and what from. And his work was the first thing that showed them, and then the world ran with this information, and you know all the rest. On that. Back um, some years ago, 35 years ago, there was initiated an international congress for vegetarian. At first it was kind of made fun of by the scientific world, but after 35 years and seven times, I joined in on this uh, meeting. There was 800 scientists attended from 34 nations. And it's respected, and the church is respected because of this work. Glory is to God, not we as the people. There was the picture of the meeting. And what was the summation? Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. Fruits, grains, vegetables prepared in a simple way, free from spice and grease of all kind, make with a little milk or cream the most healthful diet. I'll show you just a few pictures. I had the privilege of being in a mission hospital for a summer in Phuket, Thailand. This was a paradise. Island. At that time, there was no uh, tourism. Now it's a world-famous tourist place. But at that time, 
1971, it was uh, Old Thai. That was the hospital. This is a clinic three miles downtown. And that's when I had hair and it was black. <laughs> out in the waiting room, you see the door that goes out into the wait, general waiting room. There was a big well right in the middle of there. It had uh, built up about so high, the cement there. And they dropped the bucket down. And when the kids were standing there with fever, the mothers were pouring, giving hydrotherapy, pouring the water over the kids. I was, uh, the surgeon they had 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 gone for some more training, so I'd had some training in surgery, so I had the privilege of that. My classmate that was the doctor there had been there 10 years, but he did, didn't do any surgery, didn't even assist, so they were looking for somebody to help. My son was 12 years old, took these pictures. I had given the anesthetic for a, uh, for a cesarean section, a spinal tap, the nurse anesthetist was gone on vacation. So I had to do the anesthetic. And as I was doing the spinal tap, my boy with the movie camera fainted. But I caught the camera in time and saved it. And <laughs> he got up and then he took the rest of these pictures. He, he is a physician now. <clears throat> so we're doing a, delivering a baby. Here comes the head. Then we have a lady that had gangrene of the lower leg and had to take her leg off. And this was a not uncommon type of problem to deal with. This is before and after surgery. Actually, it's the first one I ever did. I'd never seen one done. <laughs> but interestingly, there was a little book that had a half a page describing how to do it, written by a doctor back in America. Here I was in Thailand, but that doctor happened to be one of my consultants back in my home. So it was, when I got <clears throat> back, I was pleased to tell him his work was valuable to me. <laughs> so now, in closing, I want to finish with this. You look to your far left. The green bar is men, yellow bar are women. The Russians, went, I went for 20 years to Russia, back and forth, presenting this story. And you've noticed that the Russian men lived to age 58, as an average. Their working life was 52. And then I would show the young men the bars at the end here, which were the vegetarian Seventh-day Adventist. I says, this can be yours, one-third more life than they had otherwise. This can be yours, you just listen the next three days as I was presenting nutrition and health education on that part. And so, to God be the glory. Amen. This, I have chosen to present this because I want us to comprehend the, and compare it with what will be coming the next few days. God has given us something that fits in with known laws of health, known laws of physics and chemistry. His message fits with his laws. Amen. We're dabbling into a system that its power is spirit, not fitting in with the natural laws of health and healing or his physical laws. We need to recognize what God gave us and be happy and give praise. We will be sharing with you some more in depth of this other. Thank you for your kind attention. All right. All right. Eric, are you to follow right now? All right. Problem with breaks, the five minute breaks turn into 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm not in charge. Okay. I'll come and introduce Eric. Why don't we just stand up and stretch? Yeah. Okay.
Are you ready? Okay, if you all are ready, I think, I think we are being put on the clock. I'm used to following, just because I'm standing up here talking doesn't mean I'm in charge. There's a lady around here. Keep your eye on her. She's the one that's running everything. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we know that your son and you are coming soon. Father, more than anything else, we want our families and ourselves to be ready to meet you. And you are the only one that can do this work. Father, our work is to surrender and lay hold on your promises, your son, by faith. Help us this week, this Sabbath, and this Sunday to hear your voice. Cause us to hear your voice. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for it, for you have promised. We ask that you will send holy angels that excel in strength. Fill thy temple with thy presence tonight. We claim the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ over this church and over this property and over every family that is represented here. Every individual. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, open your Bibles. I want to look at a, a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Just give me a, an, a, an amen once you get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Amen. Listen to what it says. I'm going to actually read verse 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul is speaking to us, not to them, to us. He says, I am jealous over you. When you read this, read your name into that. When you're alone, read your name into this. I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you, engaged you to one husband, so that I may present you as a chaste virgin, a pure virgin to Christ. In the old days... If you wanted to wear a white wedding dress when you got married, do you know what you had to do and what you had to not do in order to be able to wear a white dress? A hundred years ago, 150 years ago, you were not allowed to wear a white dress on your wedding day if you were not a virgin. Can you imagine what that would do today? I mean, I'm not even talking about the world. I'm talking about to us. Things have changed. The white gown that Christ is offering us as his bride is his righteousness. Ellen White says that gown is woven in the loom of heaven and not one human being had any part in its making. That's not her exact words. But no, there was no human hand in that gown. He says, but I fear lest by any means, just as the serpent, and the word just is implied. I'm reading from the King James. Just as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the, what's that word say? I can't hear you. It helps me if I hear you because that way I know you're still awake. From the simplicity that is in Christ. That verse bothered me for years. I was like, okay, I mean, we kind of just read over that and you just go to the next verse, the simplicity that's in Christ. Okay, the gospel's simple. A child should understand it. And we just keep right on going. And the Lord kept bringing me back to that verse, kept bringing me back to that verse. And I was like, God, there's something there that I'm just not seeing. And God talks to you sometimes. You hear him in your heart and your mind. 
You understand what I'm saying? You do. All of us have, have experienced that. And the Lord spoke to me one day and he said, Eric, look it up in the Strong's Concordance. Look it up on eSword on your, comp- on your computer. What is that word? Simplicity. And I looked it up and it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It means singleness, clarity, like gold folded together. Union is one of the other definitions. The, the simplicity, the union, the oneness that's in Christ. My brother, Dr. Edwin Noyes, talked about that, about the atonement. Do you know what Ellen White says the atonement means? At one meant. He said, Father, in John 17, verse 21, I pray that they all might be one. And we say, we got to get all our doctrines, all our ducks in a row. That's not what Jesus said. Let me tell you something. After Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, they all didn't agree on every single thing. I mean, you can read that. Paul and Apollos and Peter and and there were still things that they saw things a little differently. It doesn't mean that they were all arguing, but that's not what Christ was saying. He said, Father, I pray that they all might be one like you and I are one. I am in you and you are in me. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Do you know what the word hope there in the Greek means? Assurance. The things you've been given confidence of. The simplicity. He says, I fear lest by any means, just as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the union, the singleness, being one with Christ. That's what Satan is trying to destroy. And I'm going to show this later on in the week. Ellen White actually makes a statement. And I'm not making her a line in the sand. I want you all to understand that. I love to read Ellen White's writings. Very inspiring. Okay? But that's up to you. I'm just going to share with you some things that have inspired me. And you can decide whether you want to believe them or not. She said, when a man becomes one with Christ, he becomes one with God. And divinity and humanity combined does not commit sin. Hallelujah. That's what I want. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to make this really brief because we've got a lot of ground we're going to cover tonight. Through this week, I'll share a little bit of, of why I was invited to come. I praise God Dr. Edwin Noyes, the Lord introduced he and I a couple of years ago to one another, and we have been close friends ever since. But the Lord opened the door up in my life through a miracle that he did. And I'm, we've got the video, um, Little Light Studios did a documentary. It's a movie about the miracle that God did in my wife and I and our children's lives. It's called The Dragon Revealed, but when you type it in on YouTube, type in part one. If you don't want to watch it on YouTube, I brought a free copy of the first disc that I'll give out to every family on Sabbath. Um, God did a miracle. I was involved heavily in Eastern mysticism, martial arts, Tai Chi, Chinese healing, traditional Chinese medicine, Qigong, all that junk for 25 years as a Seventh-day Adventist. I went to church every Sabbath had family worship every evening, and I was in another temple six days a week without even knowing it. Do you understand? The devil drops one crumb, and you take a step off the path, and then another crumb, and another crumb, and 25 years later, you don't even know what the real path looks like anymore. That's how subtle he is. Spiritualism in our modern world Growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, if you asked me what spiritualism was, you know what my answer would be? Probably what most other, other Adventist Christians would say. Spiritualism, state of the dead, right? Spiritualism is a whole lot more than just the state of the dead. Ellen White uses the word spiritualism and spiritism almost interchangeably. They're connected. They're not the same thing, but they're connected. 
we want to show what this looks like today. Now, I know a lot of people are familiar with that picture of the woman holding the apple, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know where that picture comes from or where it was used within the past 10 years. Has anybody here ever heard of the Twilight series? If you haven't heard of it, praise God. Um, it's a very popular fiction um, novel. But it, it's terrifying to me because this book is like an unbelievable multi-million bestseller. And there's a woman holding out an apple. Listen to this. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. The foundation of his work to do what? To deceive the world. When I study, maybe it's because I'm, I'm so simple up here. I'm not brilliant. I don't have a, a great bunch of education. But I read stuff and I mark every book I get, I mark it to pieces. Because when I'm reading... As much as I want that book to look new, I want to understand what's in there. So I mark it, and then I go back and put little notes, and I mark it. And I read that, and I go, Satan has long been preparing for his final effort. What effort? Final. The last effort to deceive the world. The foundation of his work was laid by the assurance given to Eve in Eden. He laid a foundation, and everything he's been doing is laid on that foundation. He said, you shall not surely die. That's where most Adventist Christians stop. That's where they think spiritualism is. You shall not surely die. That's only part of the story. He said, for in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. That's called enlightened, enlightenment. Your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods. In the Gospel of Luke, I think it's chapter 3. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's chapter 3. It gives the lineage of Jesus. You know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and they begat so-and-so. Luke's lineage of Jesus is different than Matthew's lineage of Jesus. Because Luke traces it all the way back to Adam. And Luke says something that's really eye-opening. When he gets to Adam, he says, And Adam was the Son of God. Not the same as Jesus Christ. Christ was begotten. And if you, if you want to do more research on that, read Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 1 and 2. Do your own research, make your own conclusions. The Bible and Patriarchs and Prophets says he was begotten before he ever came to this world. That's Bible, Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, and that's what Ellen White says, Patriarchs and Prophets. You can make your own decision. I know we have lots of different beliefs on that. But Christ was begotten. Adam was created as the Son of God. Do you understand the difference? Satan said, if you'll eat what I'm offering you, Instead of eating from the tree of life, you can eat from the tree of forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, then you'll be like God's. How much more like God can you be than being his son or daughter? I mean, you're made in his... How much more like him can you be? And then he said something, knowing both good and evil. Do you know the Bible says Adam knew his wife Eve and they bear a son? Do you know that in John chapter 17, verse 3, it says, This is life eternal, that we might know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. When it says no, it's not just talking about intellectually. It's talking about union. One. To become one with Christ and one with God. Satan said, you can know God and me. How do we know God? By eating his word. His words are spirit and life, right? When we eat his words, his spirit comes into us. His presence comes into us. When you eat the words of Satan, whose presence comes into you then? Satan says, you can, you can eat of both trees. That was the foundation of spiritualism. 
Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. Send me an email next week, and I will send you some of the statements about Ellen White where she shows what the Lord showed her this last deception would be. The days in which we live are eventful and full of peril. The signs of the coming of the end are thickening around us. I mean, anybody in here need, need some verification of that? I mean, wow. Events are to come to pass that will be of a more terrible character than any the world has yet witnessed. For when they shall say, peace and safety... Then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We're there. I grew up telling my children, my daughter's 26, my son is 22. I grew up reading to them from the Bible and and sharing with them testimonies from the Lord about this day, one day was going to come. It's here. It's not in the future. We're living it. We are to realize that the judgments of God are about to fall upon the earth. Solemn events before us are, what's that say? I I can't hear you. Yet, does that mean past or future? Solemn events are yet to transpire. Now look at the next statement. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded vial after vial poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the world. We could spend a whole hour on this. I'm just going to touch this briefly. Many of our pioneers, because they saw what happened in 1888, the Blair Sunday Law, I mean, Sunday Law was was about to be pushed through Congress in 1888. Jones and Wagner were preaching under the power of the Holy Spirit like our church had never seen before. And Ellen White said, this is the latter rain. You have the latter rain falling. You have the Sunday law about to be passed. And you go, man, if the Sunday law is about to be passed, the latter rain's being poured out. The trumpets have to have already happened, right? That's what most of our pioneers did. They took the trumpets and they put them way back in the past. If you look in the Hebrew economy... They had, I'm not preaching feast, okay? Don't anybody misinterpret me. But there was wisdom that God gave there. It was a calendar to show us when the end was coming. You had Passover. Three days after Passover, you had... No, three days. First fruits. Christ died on Passover to the day and hour. Three days later, he rose first fruits... The Apostle Paul says he's the first fruits of them that slept. Fifty days after Passover, what happened? Pentecost, to the day and the hour. And then you went through a whole summer. When you got to the end of summer, you know what happened in the Old Testament? The seventh month. And that's interesting because if you do research, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, originally we were called the Seventh Month Movement. You can read it in the newspapers. I I was so shocked at what you can find in newspaper articles about us. We were type that in on on Google or Yahoo. Seventh month movement, Seventh Day Adventists. We were called that. Why? Because we were looking Day of Atonement, the seventh month. The Bible says it happens in the seventh month. Do you know what happened ten days before the Day of Atonement? Trumpets sounded. On Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, you know what happened? Everybody's case was reviewed and decided. You were either in Israel or you were out because you had not confessed and repented and believed on the Lamb of God. Ten days before that close of probation happened every year for ancient Israel, ten days prior to that, God would begin blowing the trumpets. He would have the priests blow the trumpets to warn the people, get ready, get ready. Time is almost up. When I look in Revelation, do you know that the trumpets are sounded and the next thing that happens in Revelation chapter 15 
is the vials are poured out. Probation is closed. We should most earnestly present before the people the warning that our Lord has commissioned us to give. Now I'm going to show you where we're at. And, and I would love to share more on this. We've got a, a film we're working on on it right now on the coming of the, anti, the Antichrist, the coming of Satan as Christ. But listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day of Christ's return shall not come except there come a falling away, an apostasy first, and that man of sin be revealed. The word revealed means unmasked or unveiled. Have you all ever read about in the Bible or in other inspired writings, have you ever read that when Christ came to this earth, he veiled his divinity in humanity? It says that. It, all through the Bible, in the Gospels, it says there were specifically, there were a number of times in the ministry of Christ where his divinity flashed through his humanity. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Is that going to happen again? Daniel chapter 12, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Do you know Paul? Do you remember Gideon? Do you remember Gideon? He had those clay pots, the jars, and he had torches inside of the jars. Do you all remember that? Raise your hand if you remember it. Okay, do you know the apostle Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels in clay pots. I believe the day is going to come where divinity is going to flash through humanity again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says here, this man of sin is going to be unmasked. There's a statement from Sister White. She says, not only, not only will Satan appear as a man but he will personate Christ. When you read that, and you've got you to gotta wrestle with this yourself. When I read it from everything I find in the Scripture, when Christ came, he came first with his divinity veiled in humanity. Wouldn't it be something else if Satan did the same thing? If Satan actually took possession of a man, and then the point got... In the game where this brilliant, angelic majesty flashed through a human body. Do you know what humanity would say? The whole world would say, this man has become a god. Do you know that's what the whole world wants right now? That's what Satan was telling Adam and Eve. You can be like a god. Man, I, I don't want to take time on this, but it's hard to pass up. If, let me back up. The Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians calls, calls this Antichrist figure the man of sin, and there's another phrase he uses. The what? The, do you know that phrase, son of perdition, is only used one other time in the entire Bible? And do you know where it's used? Judas. Do you know that Jesus said in the very beginning when the 12 disciples were there, or the 11, and Judas came among them, pushed his way in. He wanted to be part of this group. And Christ said, have I not chosen you 12, and yet one of you is a devil? And do you know Ellen White actually names what that demon was that Judas had allowed into his life? She said it was a demon of selfishness. Judas wasn't running around throwing up and cutting himself and tattoos and he had, he had yielded his life, his heart, to selfishness. Type that in on Ellen White's search, demon of selfishness. You'll be surprised what you'll find. But Judas continued over and over and over again to yield to that whisper of that fallen angel in his ear. And it got to the point on the Last Supper, the night of Passover, that Jesus said, what you have to do, do quickly. And the Bible says Satan himself entered into Judas. Satan had not been there. 
it was time to put Christ to death, and Satan said, I'm not letting anybody else handle this. This is too, this is too serious. I'm going into this man. I believe that's what's going to happen in the end, and I think we're there. This man who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or deity or that is worshipped so that he, read that to me, as God sitteth in the, in the temple of God. Most of the Christian world are looking to the Middle East. And I'm not saying that that's not going to happen, okay? Because a lot of times in the Bible there is a physical fulfillment of a prophecy but there's also a spiritual, and the spiritual is always the one that is the most important. So it would not surprise me if the Vatican moved their th throne to Jerusalem. That wouldn't surprise me, but that's not the issue. So that he sitteth in the temple of God. The Apostle Paul tells us something. What? Know you not that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The throne of the heart is what Satan wants. Yes, he may sit over there. He may not. I'm not worried about what happens over there. That's just a physical sign. You can look at people all around you, not just in the world, but even in our churches, and you can see people whose heart is either being surrendered and yielded to Christ or it's being yielded to the wicked one. Then the Apostle Paul says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? But now you know what, or he that withholdeth, that he might be revealed, speaking of the Antichrist, in his time, for the mystery of what? Of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. In Paul's day, this was funny because this was... Um, a Greek and Roman theater. That's why I chose that picture. There, there's something hiding behind the mask. And the question came to my mind, the mystery of iniquity. Do you know how many studies you can find on the Bible where people are trying to figure out what that is? What is the mystery of iniquity? Listen to what Sister White said. All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. And I asked the Lord, I said, okay, God, let me see where we're at here. I said, what's the mystery of iniquity? And the Lord, the Lord spoke almost instantly. He said, Eric, he said, there's two mysteries. There's two mysteries spoken of in the Bible above every other. The mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out what the mystery of iniquity is, and the Lord said, you find out what the mystery of godliness is, and you'll know what the mystery of iniquity is already, because it's the exact opposite. So when you go to 1 Timothy 3.16, do you know what the Apostle Paul tells us? He says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Emmanuel. Hallelujah. If you get a chance this week, read one page in Desire of Ages. It's page 161. And we're going to talk about this um, while Dr. Edwin Noyes and I are here. But read it on your own. Desire of Ages, page 161. It's the chapter, I think it's called, In His Temple. It's where Christ went in and cast out all the buyers and sellers. That one page will give you food for thought for months. It has me for the past couple of years. It'll change everything in your Christian walk. Two mysteries. So if the mystery of godliness is God manifest in the flesh, what is the mystery of iniquity? Satan and fallen angels manifest in human flesh. Do you know in Revelation chapter 18 it says that? Come out of her, my people. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and has become the hold of every unclean spirit and the cage of every hateful and un unclean bird. I'm talking about demons, evil spirits. 
You have two cities in the Bible. You have Jerusalem, which is us. It represents God's people. Daniel chapter 9 tells us that. And then you have Babylon. It's not just Rome. Yes, Rome is the capital of Babylon. But you've got Jerusalem and you've got Babylon. Jerusalem is filled with the Spirit of God. Babylon is filled with the Spirit of the enemy. Isaiah chapter 14, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Yea, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of, what's it say? The mount of the congregation? I mean, it's like we read over that sometimes and don't stop and go, wait a minute. The mountain. If you ask any child, and you watch, because I'm going to ask them, maybe Sabbath. You ask any child, five years old, three years old, six years old, draw me a mountain. You know what they'll draw? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know when you go to Revelation, it gives the description of the New Jerusalem, and it says it lieth four square, and its height is equal to one of its sides. It's only got two shapes that fit that description. It's either a cube or it's a mountain. Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Do you understand what I'm saying? Satan said, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. The mount of us, his people. Daniel chapter 9, verse 16 through 19, Daniel says, Thy people and thy mountain and thy city are all one and the same. Different descriptions of one people. God's mountain, his people, and his city. He says, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High. I wish I had the, the, you know, the little map compass. You go to a map, it always has that little thing in the corner where it shows you where north, south, east, and west is. That's north. North face. Has anybody got any clothing from a company called north? Do you understand? Satan said, I'm going to be where you're supposed to be. When they look in my eyes or in your eyes or your people's eyes, instead of seeing your spirit, they'll see my spirit looking back. Because... Out of the heart. You know how they say the, the eyes are the windows to the soul? Satan says, I'm sitting on the throne of their heart. I've had mothers come to me and my wife when we've gone to share about spiritual warfare. And we don't talk about stuff that's crazy. We're just talking about what, what Sister White says and what the Bible says. And I've had mothers come up to me and say, I need to talk to you. I've got a four-year-old little boy or a five-year-old little boy and there's times where he will pitch a temper tantrum and I look in his eyes and it's not him. And I'm not trying to make people freak out, but I'm saying, this is Adventist. And, and the mother's in tears because she's like, I didn't know what it was, but I, I got scared. And now hearing this, I'm understanding something else is influencing my child's heart. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. This, this startles me. And the great dragon, that old serpent, called the devil or adversary, and Satan, the accuser, that's what the word Satan means in Hebrew, he cast out of his mouth water as a flood. Do you know Christ talks about his word like being like water? It talks about that all through the Bible. Come unto me, all you that thirst, and I will give you living water. It's his word. Satan said, I'm casting water out of my mouth like a flood after the woman so that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Do you know what's funny? We can come to church and spend, let's say we had a really, really powerful Sabbath and we spent four hours at church that Sabbath. Do you know that everywhere you go, almost every single place you go outside of this church, you're hearing the devil preach to you all day long. Every television you walk by, 
every restaurant you go into, every department store you go shopping at, you walk into Target or Walmart, you're hearing the devil preach to you through the music that's being played. And people go, oh, I don't listen to it. Let me tell you something. It doesn't make any difference. It's going in. You've got to actively and by faith say, God, protect me. This is your temple. Great Controversy, 1888. And this is from Revelation 16. The Apostle John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. If you ask a child to show you a frog, a bunch of three-year-olds or four-year-olds, show me a frog. They'll do one of two things. They'll start jumping or they'll stick their tongue out. That, that's, that, that's what a frog does. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, which are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Satan says, I'm pouring out water like a flood. I'm, I'm sending out messages to reach the hearts of people. Except those who are kept by, by the power of God through faith in his word. That means God said something, you've got to believe it. And that means, well, how do I make myself believe it if I don't feel like I believe it? Faith is not what you feel. Faith is what you do. In Hebrew, the word faith is an action. It's a verb. It's what you do. I believe, so I did. Believe is not just up here like it is in, in our English language. Believe is in your hands, in your feet, in your mouth. You say it, you speak it, you do it. Except those who are kept by the power of God. When God created the world, it says he spoke and said, let there be light and... And what? He said, let there be light. And there was. And then he says to us, be ye therefore holy, because I am holy. And we go, I'm trying. He said, well, I didn't tell you to try. I told you to be. We don't grasp that. How? It's, you don't have any part of that. You say, I am. I, I, I'm, if I have to break this into two messages, we will. But this is important. I don't want you to go home this week, and I know Dr. Noyes doesn't either, with us just having a bunch of head knowledge. How many people in here have children? Doesn't matter what age they are, have children. Can you remember the first day that you saw your little boy or little girl? Raise your hand. I remember when I held my little girl. She was born first. I remember when my wife gave birth to our son, and I held my little boy. You know the first thing that a mother or father says to that child? You are daddy's little girl. You are daddy's little boy. You are mommy. That's the first thing you say to them. Do you know what? They believe you for the rest of their life. You can ask a child. How many people have heard of a child coming home from school and they're crying and they're all upset? And you're like, what's wrong? They said I was adopted. They, did. You know, they get all worked up because somebody at school told them that you're not really their mother and father. And you're like, that's the silliest thing. You know, of course I'm your mom and dad. Do you all understand what I'm saying? How do you know? Because he told you so. He told you. God says... I told you you're my son. 1 John 3, verse 1 through 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And the word sons there means children begotten, so it includes daughters. Now, today, we are sons and daughters of God. It says that. Okay, so what are we waiting for? God, what do I need to do to become your son? Stand up and walk like it. Believe me. I said, be holy. I didn't say try to be. I said, be. And you go, okay, so i got to walk by faith. Absolutely. Every single moment of every day. I cannot sin, for I am a child of God. And God's seed remains in me. His word remains in me. 1 John 3, 9. We have to believe him. 
The people are fast being lulled to a fatal security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth, and again ascending back to heaven. And they were preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel, and give power and force to this message. I'm not going to get into this today, but I hope we will this week. Do you know what, if you ask most Adventists, do you know what what they'll say? What's the third angel's message? Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. The Pope is Antichrist. Saturday's the Sabbath, not Sunday. Do you know what Ellen White said? Righteousness by faith in verity. You know, that's the whole reason the Sabbath is important. How do we know? The Sabbath is a sign that we believe that God created. How did He create? He spoke it. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11 through 19, and Isaiah 63, verse 1, He says, I am the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. I speak righteousness. He says that. I declare things and make them right. Isaiah 45, verse 17 through 19. He says, I declare things and make them right. How are you going to fix this, Lord? Everything is black. God goes, no problem. Let there be light. Boom! Done. And it was good. Man's got leprosy. How are you going to fix this one, Lord? I will. Be thou whole. Boom! He was healed instantly. A woman's a prostitute. She didn't get caught in adultery for the first time. She's a prostitute. What are you going to do for me, Lord? You're a virgin. Boom! She's clean. Ellen White says, I don't have the quote, but I can get it for you this week. She said, the moment the sinner lays hold on Christ by faith, that moment their sins are no longer upon them. Then she says something that's even more powerful. She says, you stand guiltless before the law clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Do you understand what guiltless means? It does not mean pardoned and forgiven alone. Guiltless means you never did it. Do you understand that? He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in Him. Guiltless! They open up the books in heaven and the judgment, and they're like, who are we looking for? Oh, it's Eric Wilson. And the devil's like, oh, I I got a list on him. I can't wait. He's dead for sure. And when you all see this film, The Dragon Revealed, you'll understand why he said that. And that's just the stuff I was willing to admit. And you know what? They're turning the pages. He goes, oh, Wilson. Here, it's Eric Wilson. Christ. And Christ goes, yeah, that's my son. And he hands the book to his father. And his father goes, Jesus, this is you. This is you. Our sins have been blotted out by the blood of the Lamb. By faith alone. But remember, faith acts. Great power and glory were imparted to this angel. And as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. Do you want to build a bigger church? If, if we take hold of this message, not a theory of righteousness by faith. God said it, I am. That's why our Father's name is written in our foreheads. What's our Father's name? The great I am. I am delivered from sin because he said so. I am free from sin and condemnation because he said so. I have victory. I am more than a conqueror because he said so. Not because he said it. How many times does he have to say it before we believe it? If you want this church to be walls being pushed out, start sharing with people how to get victory over sin. 
Ellen White says the only way we can ever keep the Sabbath holy is if by faith we have been kept holy throughout the entire week. That's what the Sabbath is a sign of, that the Lord sanctifies us. And we can't be an evolutionist. You want to read a good article by A.T. Jones? It's called Creation versus Evolution and Lessons on Faith. An evolutionist says that's going to take a lifetime. It'll take a lifetime for God to make me holy. Have you all heard that before? Sanctification is the work of a lifetime, right? And I know I, I get in trouble for this all the time, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's true. It doesn't take God a lifetime to make somebody holy because he didn't have a lifetime with the thief on the cross. And that man will be in heaven, guaranteed. The work of a lifetime is appropriating Christ's life and victory as your own every moment for the rest of your life. That's the work of a lifetime. If it takes him a lifetime to make me holy, he gave me victory over, over um, alcohol almost 30 years ago. I have never had a drop since. So why does it take him a lifetime to fix the rest of the stuff? It doesn't take him a lifetime to fix anything. It didn't take him a lifetime to heal that leper. It takes you believing him and walking in faith. Now we're going to get to the, the main part of the message. The forces of darkness will unite with human agents. Like my brother Edwin Noyes said, Satan is counterfeiting what God has done. Satan doesn't come up with anything new. It's always a counterfeit. And you'll see this on Sabbath unbelievably. The forces of darkness will unite with human agents who have given themselves to the control of Satan. And the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. People say, I would never, I would never give myself to the control of Satan. Well, if it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm sitting there watching TV and I should have been in bed an hour ago or two hours ago and all of a sudden the thought pops into my head about that pound cake that's in the refrigerator, right there's the decision. Do I yield to Christ or do I yield to my belly and the whispers of the enemy? And I'm, I'm using that as an example because I've been through that battle. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be transformed into fiends, devils. And those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their creator, will become the habitation of dragons. That's her words. That startled me because being in the martial arts, I knew a whole lot about dragons. spiritualism in America. This is just interesting. I grew up with my mom reading to me the Bible and Revelation and Daniel, and she used to read this little red book called Early Writings. I remember that. Spiritualism was like, wow, there was this little old lady 150 years ago, and she talked about this and that, and, and I was like, this little old lady, I mean, Ellen White, you know, it's just, it's, it, it was like not real. It was like a, a, a story. Do you understand what I'm saying? I couldn't put it in front of me. And then I got online and I looked up the Fox sisters. Do you know, I found all kinds of articles in all kinds of newspapers about the Fox sisters. That was the birth of spiritualism in America. There were preachers of every denomination that were condemning what the Fox sisters were doing. It's worth looking at. That was, they lived from 1814 to 1890. Um, the Ouija board. How many people in here have ever heard of a Ouija board? Do you realize that that was put on the market in 1890? The same time that God was raising up this church, this message, and us as a people, look what Satan was doing. 1890, 1890. And Ellen White used to talk about um, theosophy. This is the founder, Madam H. P. Uh, Blavowski. I know you, if you've ever watched Walter Weiss sermons, you've probably heard about her. A lot of other people are talking about her. She was one of the highest occult feminine leaders in the world. 
She lived right there where Ellen White did in New England. She lived from 1831 to 1891. All of this was happening at the same time God was giving the message to God's people. And it wasn't just in the Advent message. This was all over. There were people that were being awakened. Spiritism and spiritualism. This is a quick definition. It is the study and practice of communicating with spirit entities or the dead through the use of a medium or a channel. I learned this from Little Light Studios. Has anybody here ever heard of them before? When I first saw their very first documentary, I was like, oh, wow. The, the root word for medium is media. Media. That can be digital. It can be literature. And a channel. I'm sitting here pressing the channels. I'm like, oh, I don't want to listen to that medium. I want to change the channel. I'll listen to another medium. It's still Satan speaking to me. It's hard to find something on television or the radio that's not the devil just voicing his thoughts through a person. And I'm going to go through these quickly. But I want to, and I'm, let me back up. I'm going to show this because we don't have a whole lot of real young people like teenagers. We have a few here tonight. But the ones that we do have that I've met so far <clears throat> are God-fearing young people. So I know that they wouldn't know anything about the current pop craziness. So I'm going to deal with our older folks' craziness. Robin Williams. Anybody know who he is? Robin Williams? Some of y'all remember Mork? Okay. Listen to what he said. And I, I hate what happened to this man. I mean, I hate what happened to him. He said, yeah, literally. He used to do stand-up comedy before he did acting. And he's talking about doing the comedy. He said, literally, it's like possession. All of a sudden, you're in. And because it's in front of a live audience, you just get this energy that just starts going. But there's also that thing. It is possession. In the old days, you'd be burned for it. But there is something empowering about it. I mean, it is a place where you are totally. It is like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where you really can become this other force. Maybe that's why I don't need to play evil characters in the movies, because sometimes on stage you can cross that line and come back. This is Robin Williams. He committed suicide. And people go, oh, it was the drugs. It wasn't the drugs. It was the demons. He talked about the evil spirits that he was battling with. Anybody know who that lady is? We need to pray. I'm not criticizing these people. We need to pray for the ones that are still alive. Because if God could reach Oprah Winfrey, can you imagine the good she could do? It'd be like turning Paul around. Listen to what she said. She has the largest church in the world. You know that. Her audience is millions. They call it the Church of Oprah. She said, I ask God for grace. The word grace in Greek is from the Greek 5485. It means the divine influence. That's what the word means. That's the first definition, the divine influence. She said, I ask God for grace and the power of the spirits, plural, spirits. Not Holy Spirit, spirits. And then she said, calling on you, calling on you. I really believe I can call her, this spirit, up. Her and so many others. When she played in a movie years ago called The Color Purple, I wish I'd never seen it. Um, this is what she was talking about. They asked her about how she was able to portray that character in that film. And she said, I asked those spirits from those slaves to come into me and play the parts that they knew. That was her words. Oprah Winfrey calls these her go-there moments, spiritual episodes of divine guidance that far transcend the chatty exchanges with her studio audiences. Winfrey says that she has come to know each of them personally and calls them in at will to guide her in her work. Uh-oh. Little House on the Prairie. I grew up, I mean, Seventh-day Adventist Christian, Disney's okay, Andy Griffith is okay, 
The louse on the prairie is okay. This is safe television for your family. This was written by his daughter. When her dad would be having trouble, either it doesn't mean just on the louse on the prairie. It could have been one of the other shows that he was doing. But when he had trouble with a script, she said he would go into his room at night, lock the door, and come out the next morning, and the script would be all done by himself. And that You can't do a whole script for a, a film in one night. You can't do it. He said, I felt my father's presence with me enlightening my memories. His father had died years before. Helping me to commit to paper the feelings I had. I really heard my father speaking to me from the other dimension, filling my mind with just the right words. The story came so fast and was so right, in three days the script was complete. The House on the Prairie. Safe family movies. This is a little more modern. Keanu Reeves. He said in an interview with actor Keanu Reeves, he was asked about how he deals with his inner demons. He laughed and said, they always win. That means, I mean, I don't even try to fight them anymore. If I have an inclination to go drink, I go drink. If I have an inclination to go party or to go be immoral, I just yield. There's no fight. They always win. And then he said, it's hard to act in the morning when the muses are asleep. Kevin Bacon, some of you may remember him from years ago. He said, part of acting is to lose yourself in the moment, to let the chaos or the muse come and just enter in and happen organically. The demons under the surface, as an actor, you have to keep them bubbling. There was a movie that was came out about a very, very, I believe, God-fearing man um, that was in the military. What was the name of the, the book and the film? Not ha was it Hacksaw? Okay. The man, if you ever want to find something interesting, the man that they got to play his part, he's a Roman Catholic. And you can find the interview on, on YouTube. He actually said that for him to play that part, which it was directed by Mel Gibson, I'm praying for Mel Gibson, but he said to play that part, he said, I needed to, I needed to be able to, to get in touch with Desmond Doss. He said, so I went to Chattanooga, outside Chattanooga, where Doss's farm was. He said, I went to the farm, and I spent the whole day there alone. I held his tools. I sat in his chair. I walked in his barn, walked in his fields, he was trying to connect with Desmond Doss's spirit. And he said, it worked. It worked. I'm like, I, you know, I'm not even going to go there. I don't understand. I'm like, guys, if we want to portray a God-fearing man, we don't need to have demons have any part in it. Amen. Now listen to this. Keanu Reeves and Kevin Bacon. This is Socrates. 20 Almost 2,400 years ago, listen to what this philosopher said. He said, I like the manner of the muse. First of all, to inspire men herself, because they are inspired. And the word inspired means inspirited and possessed. They are simply inspired to utter that which the muse impels them. For it is not by art or knowledge do you say what you say, but by possession. He's talking about actors. I, it's five minutes till eight, and I don't want to push anybody, so I need, tell me how much time we've got before I need to close. Okay. We'll pick up, we'll pick up where we leave off tonight. When I was in the martial arts, um, and it wasn't just fighting. The fighting part I did for many years, and then you get to a certain point where you know that to be able to do what you see the masters do, there has to be more than physical power. I saw the grandmaster that I had trained under for over 20 years. He weighed about 175, maybe 180 pounds. I saw him one day go over and take a 150, 120, 150-pound boxing bag that you box with, 
he grabbed that thing with one hand and he held it up and he shook it and threw it on the floor. You cannot do that. Arnold Schwarzenegger cannot pick up a bag and shake it like that and throw it on the ground. So you know there has to be something besides just physical strength. Because I don't care how much you run, you're never going to outrun a cheetah. I don't care how many push-ups you do or how much bench presses you do. There's a physical limit to human strength and ability. And as I was tempted to, to touch in and seek for that power... It started coming, and, and it was so subtle how it came at first. I can remember after I made black belt, it took 14 years. After I made that black belt in that style, and I began teaching full-time, it started coming much faster. I would have a student walk in, because I taught privately during the daytime. I would have a student walk in, and let's say it was a female student. Maybe she's in her 30s or 40s. And she'd walk in the back door, and it was like I'd look at her, and without knowing how, I knew she'd had a fight with her husband. I knew. Or I knew something that I would know things without knowing how I knew them. And I would ask her, how are you and your husband doing? And she'd just look at me like, and you know what that does if you're the, the one that knows without knowing how you know? It builds ego. You go, oh, wow. Wow. I mean, and the devil says, it's all that training. It's all the training you've done. It's not all the training you've done. It's the demons whispering in your ear what they know happened at her house. They, they, they call them up. Yes, her and her husband had a fight. Okay, and then this demon's over here talking to me, telling me. They communicate. It's so subtle. And I remember one time I went to see an iridologist, the people that, you know, Look at your eyes and the iris of your eye and tell you what's wrong with you. And we're going to get into that this week. But I, I was in the martial arts. I was heavy. And I was heavy into energy because that was where the power was. And I wanted to find out um, because I'd been battling with diabetes since I was 14 years old. And I was like, maybe this guy's got something he can offer. And I went in there and I said, he said, fill out this chart, you know, and then I'll, I'll be right with you. It's my first time I'd ever been. And... I looked at him and I said, I don't want to fill out any paperwork. I said, I'll sign a waiver, but I don't want to give you any, inf any information about my family, my history, nothing. And he looked at me and said, why? I said, because I really want to know if what you're doing, I said, I'm all on board. If what you're doing works, I want it. But I want to know you didn't figure this out by crunching the numbers, by reading my family chart. I want to know that you knew because what you do through iridology really works. He said, no problem. Sat down, looked at my eye. He said, oh, he said, you've got a family history with problems with your pancreas. And I'm sitting, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I was like, how did you know that? He said, I can see it right. Well, let me do this. He started telling me all kinds of things. He didn't know what he was doing. The information was being given him. And the devil whispered in the other and said, and it's all that training. It's all the stuff you've been learning. It's all these years of practice. And man's ego just grows, and he doesn't even realize he's a tool of the enemy. We'll pick up tomorrow. I pray that, that what we share this week will help you, and I, I want to encourage you, don't look at other people, because it's easy to do. And I know what's wrong with her. I mean, I just went to that meeting, you know, Wednesday night or Thursday night. Man, they got a demon. I know what this is. Don't do that. Don't do that. This is for us to look at ourselves and say, am I yielding somewhere in my life ground to the enemy? I don't want to yield anymore. If I yield to God, Christ will come in. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what you and what your son have done for us on Calvary. We thank you that his blood shed for every one of us individually cleanses us from all sin. And Father, we claim your promise that you will come and dwell in us and walk in us. You will be our mighty God. 
Lord Jesus Christ, go with every family and every individual that is represented here. We lift every person that comes to these meetings and their families in prayer and all of your people across the world. Fill us with your presence, your Holy Spirit, and your power and your love for others. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.